Welcome, welcome once again to DC Sports Series and today we're going Olympics as we prepare for the Tokyo 2021 this year. I think it's about two months away and we are always involved with athletes' physical prowess ahead of the Olympics and smashing of Olympic records. Also, we feel that a successful Olympics is the one that thrills the world with amazing cultural display and wonderful um, lightning skills and pyrotechnics often at the opening and then the closing ceremony of the games. At times we forget that the Olympics existed once it's over. What this means is that the Olympiad, which is the four years that we have to wait for the next Olympics, goes unnoticed. But it's important to point out here that host cities that bid to host the Olympics have based their interest to host the Olympics on sustainable Olympic legacies, uh, which often comes in the form of um, social inclusion, employment opportunities, fiscal and health education programs, environmental and community development. All these are packaged in a program. And I will take you through some of these programs, uh, I think for the past 20 years, beginning from 2000. So in Sydney 2000, um, there was the program introduced by the host nation, Australia, called the National Education Program, which reached about 15,000 communities in Australia. In Athens 2004, and despite, despite the setbacks um, in this particular Olympics, they introduced um, the program, the Olympic Education Program, where Olympism was taught in school. And they called um, a program called, um, I think, um, Welcome Back to Athens. And this program basically taught many people um, in uh, Greece about the uh, Olympic Olympism. In Beijing, Olympic education program for primary and secondary school was introduced. And in London, there was the Get Set program that um, targeted young people in schools. And also, um, there was a more global program called International Inspiration that also reached um, 12 million children in 20 countries. So 12 million in 20 countries, you know, embodying London 2012. In Brazil, uh, that's the Rio 2016, there was the Transformer, um, I think Transformer in Portuguese, uh, which basically means Transformer in English, to transform something. And what has happened so far after the um, hosting of the games, the, the two weeks um, of the Olympics, what has happened to Transformer? Well, today we have um, Eduardo um, Scofano Buta, and uh, he was the member of the um, Rio 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Organizing Committee, and he also he was also the um, strategic communication and senior analyst for the FIFA 2014 World Cup that was hosted in Brazil. And then um, he'll be telling us more about what has happened to Transformer, um, whether it's transformed into another program or whether it's still going. He will tell us more because he's been part of this. I hope you stay tuned and learn something new. Um, enjoy. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Eduardo, for making some time um, to, you know, uh, talk about uh, what we'll be talking about today, and um, especially with your involvement with the Olympics, the Rio Olympics primarily. And so we, we, we would also talk about the, your involvement with the 2014 FIFA um, Games, but not uh, into details. Much of the discussions will be on the, um, will be about the um, Rio 2016, I guess, um, in Brazil. So um, to begin with, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Who is Eduardo for those watching? Sure, Derek. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. I hope we have a nice debate for your audience. Well, uh, my name is Eduardo in Portuguese <laughs> and people call me Edu. I live in Rio, born and raised here. 
Uh, I have a bachelor degree in journalism, but I have been working with sports for the last 10 years, I'd say. Something not many people know is I actually started my career in the tobacco industry, quite young. And then I, I, I soon realized, okay, this is not what, I'm, I, what I want to do with my life. So I had this turn for sports and I'm really happy. And this is the area that, I don't know, makes me work happy and see that I'm helping people through some, this is a strong tool. And I think we, we are able to do great things with it. Well, that sounds interesting. From tobacco to sports, what a very interesting relationship. But then uh, somebody would want to ask, how did you, what was the turning point to know that you'll be very instrumental when it comes to sports media and communication? How, how did you get into this? Yeah, so uh, you for sure, you know, Brazil loves football, right? We're the yeah. football country. Yeah. Although we are not doing great in the last years. And I, I have, I've played football for my entire life. And I love to watch sports, not only uh, football. And then when I was in the, uh, in the journalism course, I was looking for, okay, let's see what I want to do. Because this is a, an, an area that's very, it's quite open. You know, there are so many things you can do when, you, when yeah. it comes to communication. And then I started in the tobacco industry, and it's this, it's something that really, uh, well, they, they offer you a great environment, let's say, in, in terms of human resources, because they, they need to keep you there, right? So the money is good, the structure is good, and you enter young, you don't really know what you want to do with your life. So I was there for one year, two years, and then I decided, okay, this is not for me. I want to find the product, the segment I really love. So yeah. what do I like? I like education and I like sports and I like communications. So my challenge was how do I bring these three areas together? And this is what I have been doing for the last years. And, and I really like it. Well, this is fantastic. I know there are so many people who want to venture into the field of sports, but it's always difficult in terms of what would be the outcome. Where am I going to work? and all that. So thank you for sharing that journey. Um, I equally have that same issue in um, university. I've, I've already known I, I want to be in sports, but where in sports is always the question. Yeah, so, and then I started, mm -hmm. sorry, I started in a TV, in a sports TV channel. Great. From then I went to the World Cup, then the Olympic Games, then this social educational project. So, uh, so many options, right? I think the yeah. important thing is, uh, not only work with sports, but you leave a legacy, you leave a positive message. Yeah. And I think this is what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, that's, that's, that's also very good. And um, so how did you start? Did you just start working or did you volunteer? And uh, on top of it, you can also share how you, you, you get involved with the World Cup, uh, the World Cup and then the Olympics as well. Okay, so I started as an intern for this sports TV channel, working 10, 11, 12 hours a day, getting not a lot of money. But it was, uh, it was something great because I worked for the Olympic, uh, Olympic structure of this TV channel. Yeah. And this is something, it's not quite common in, I would say, in developing countries in general to have specific TV uh, programs for Olympic sports. Usually you want to get your main like sport, maybe two or three different sports, and then you don't even talk about the other uh, activities, right? So this, is, was, this was the first moment when I opened my eyes for, for all the different activities, the different sports, uh, athletes from everywhere in the, in the world. So it's, I would say this was my first door and yeah. from there, I, I didn't want, I didn't even want to look at football just for fun at my place with my team. But in terms of work, this was the, the moment I decided, okay, well, I want to go beyond our number one sport and help other activities to, to, I mean, to grow in Brazil. Yeah. Well, that's really good. I've always said that it's always good to start seven people, volunteer, be an intern. And that's where you gain the experience and understand the nuances of sport. So 
Yeah. And thank you for sharing that. And you but, might but, you yeah. might even realize you don't want to work with that. That's a possibility. Yeah. But it's it's better to soon realize that in a position you're not like the top manager or something yeah. like that. So you can say, okay, yeah. this is not for me. Let's move on. Yeah. The the field the field of sports itself is very experiential, but, and and you cannot just study and then go and do it. But you have to experience in terms of management, in terms of playing whether you want to be a player and all that, because the, the, um, the amalgamation of these two makes you um, fit well into the industry. Otherwise, you'll be bullied here and there, I guess, or you may not even get a job to do. Anyway, now let's go to a, a more general overview about the Rio Olympics. I have a question that's in your estimation. Do you think um, the Olympic was a success? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. I would say, Derek, it really depends on the point of view. Yeah. I mean, let's say for the International Olympic Committee, yeah. I think that for the IOC, it was a huge success. Yeah. Why do I say that? Because uh, in 2016, Brazil was going through an impeachment process of yeah. our president. We had the Zika virus yeah. and our, our arenas were not ready. So you can imagine in, in, for the IOC, the, the big risk they, they had in their hands. But then, yeah. boom, we just did the games and they went great in this point of view. So for the IOC, it was good. For the athletes, I also believe they, they enjoyed it. Because let's be honest, what do athletes want in the Olympic Games? Yeah. They go to the city, they want to compete. Some of them are trying the medals, some of them are, are trying their best. But yes. once it's over, once their competition is over, they want to have fun. They want to enjoy the culture. They want to talk to their friends. And I think Rio has a lot to offer in this sense. Yeah. So I also think the athletes like it. But in terms of the Brazilian society, our people, I don't think the legacy was that positive. Yeah. A lot of public money involved. And we, we really went over what we imagined in terms of budget. Yeah. And the legacy was... I mean, I would say fragile. In some points, we did a good job. And I would say, in, let's, uh, for example, in the educational area, we did all right. We did good. But in terms of infrastructure and transportation and revitalizing some areas, I think we had very, very serious problems. So it depends on the point of view, right? Well, and this has always been the main, um, would I say... Um, the main points um, in bidding for the Olympics. Uh, people always talk about sustainability. Um, this time, no one talks about legacy anymore, but sustainability. How would it uh, move on beyond the Olympics in terms of transportation, in terms of health, in terms of inclusion, um, and all that? But um, in, in your estimation, the three categories that you mentioned, <clears throat> I beg your pardon. <clears throat> Beg your pardon, the three categories, athletes, Brazil, and then the IOC. Who are the winners and who are the losers? You can, you can share this with me. Absolutely. With the, the, winners, the winners, IOC, and the athletes. The losers, it's, it's a very strong expression, right? But I don't think Brazil got as much as we could from the Olympic Games. That's for sure. Um, I think it's, we had too much money involved for what we get five years later. If you go to our Olympic park, it's abandoned. There's no one there. So, I mean, what's the point of investing so much money, creating this huge area, and then you don't use it five years after the Olympic games. You know, you go to Seoul, to South Korea, and you go to the Olympic park, and it's one of the most visited areas. And I mean, it was 1980, right, Korea? I mean, 30, 40 years after the games. And they still use it, and it's still great. It's a place for families, a place for sports, for culture. So it, it can't be that hard to plan. Uh, I mean, okay, we, once the games are over, what we're going to do with this? This is the question. And this is why so many cities are quitting uh, bidding for the, the Olympic Games, right? Yeah. So, yeah, this is, I think the IOC had a great moment here in Rio. But I cannot say the same about our people. Okay. So in effect, uh, maybe Brazil, we wouldn't say lost, but it's kind of like in the losing end. Is it fair to say? Yeah, I think 
we had a huge chance, a huge, uh, a huge potential in our hands, and we didn't use it the proper way. Yeah. Same for the World Cup. I mean, even worse for the 2014 World Cup. Because what happened is at least the Olympic Games are kind of concentrated in one city. So you get some legacy, you get something done. For the World Cup, you only have the football arenas and Brazil is a huge country. So you have, uh, I mean, you travel for so many hours, even in the airplane for, to go from one place to the other. And you don't have the education, you don't have the sustainability, you don't have the environment legacy. You just go, you play football and you go home. And the arenas are also abandoned. So for the World Cup, I think it's even more complicated. Yeah. Well, I spoke about the um, Olympics um, earlier on. I spoke about sports itself as being an experiential field. You have not just experienced the Olympics, but you played um, an integral role in the Rio Olympics. And also you are a scholar of sports management. So my next question is, this, um, in your view, what do you think of the Olympics vis-a-vis -vis the Olympism? That's the Olympic idea. Yeah. Uh, for most of my time in the, the organizing committee for Rio 2016, I worked for the education program. So we, are, we were dealing with Olympism every single day. I think one thing is, it's, it's important to mention is I hear a lot of people talking about the, the qualities of sports, the positive values, but I don't hear that often that sports may bring the worst thing we have in our society as well. Yeah. So uh, we need a lot of intention if we want to use sports and Olympism to develop these educational values but not only the good intention, but also we need to measure if we're working well or not. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're just going to have this nice speech and say, OK, so let's create this project and we're going to teach kids how to work in group and they're going to respect each other. OK, how do you prove it? How do you get the money for this project if you don't have the data to show to the companies or to your government or anyone else? So. Uh, I think Olympism is real, and I do believe sports is a strong tool to change society, not on, on its own, but it's, it's, well, it's something we can work with, but I think we need to, to make it really professional. It's, it's not only talk about the values. You need to treat this in, in a very serious way and try to put in data what we believe sports can bring. And it's not easy, <laughs> for sure it's not easy because it's, yeah. it's not something that measurable when you talk about values, it's, it's hard to put in numbers, but yeah. we need to evaluate it. Yeah, it, it's always difficult to have, um, to put theory into practice. Well, I've always described the Olympics as a sensational fortnight event, after which usually people forget what happens next and the Olympia goes unnoticed. And um, my question is this, the Olympic Value Education Program has been going on. Um, yeah. and national Olympic bodies um, or Olympic committees um, have been running this. And, and I think it's even in, in most um, educational curriculum of um, various curriculum, various um, um, countries. Now the question is this, from, I'll take it from 2000 Athens all the way to um, the Rio, where we've had various Olympic value education programs, which has been part of the bidding process. And the more recent one is the Get, Get Start or Get Set program in um, the London 2012. London, and then they, they, yeah. they, 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 they took a more global uh, um, approach with the international inspiration. Um, in Brazil, I know there was Transformer. What has happened yeah, uh, okay. so far with Transformer? Uh, and I think the, the first thing is these programs work well if they don't follow the one size fits all point of view. So you get the OVAP, but you need to adapt it to your reality. Yeah. And this, is, this was the first step we did in Rio with Transforma because, you know, the structure in London in terms of schools and sports for all is absolutely different from Brazil, right? We, our schools... Uh, only 30% of them have a proper space to practice sports. So many teachers have to do it inside the classroom. Yeah. So uh, our 
number one challenge was okay let's get over and see how do we apply this to our school's reality and then we created transformer transformer which means of course to transform uh had two main goals the first one was to take new sports to public schools okay so let's stop only football 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 sometimes volleyball at the best and let's bring the new activities let's bring new sports and we're not looking for top athletes we're looking for the first contact with sports so that those children that don't like football they don't get bullied and they don't get a sedentary lifestyle because this is what happens if you don't have the first contact in with uh, physical activities in school in a fun and enjoyable way you're gonna start to avoid it and if you avoid it as a kid the the all data shows that you're you have this big tendency of avoiding as an adult as well so we we had partnerships with the national federations yep. so we got for example the badminton federation no one knows anything about badminton in brazil so they have this uh, this herd in, in to 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 spread their sport in our country so we brought them we brought them and we said okay let's adapt all the technical the, the technical knowledge you have to the physical education teachers so they can take your sports to children so this was the number one goal to take new sports to schools and the other one it was to use those sports to develop the values we we spoke about uh in a very intentional way yeah so we reached more than 20,000 schools in brazil mm -hmm. uh, we had online and live training for the physical education teachers we did not go to the students it was a training of trainers project so we want them to i mean to to bring it down to the students and i think it was a, a a nice project we we were obviously not the focus of rio 2016 so we had to fight in the good sense for everything yeah. for our space yeah. but but we 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 got some nice results and then we reached the sustainability issue <laughs> because okay we started in 2013 great 2014 2015 but then you get to 2016 and the ioc is already looking at tokyo once the games are over bye bye let's go to the next place and the organizing committee as well it gets closed right but uh, i'm not cutting you but don't you think once the olympic fire is off then the host nation is they are done with the host nation <laughs> No, I mean, the <laughs> thing is, I, I totally understand the IOC yeah. to go elsewhere. Yeah. But the challenge is, how do the hosting country keeps everything working, right? How, yeah. Because it's not going to be the IOC who's going to be worried about the legacy. Exactly. They just want to make the games and that's it. So this was the big challenge because we had the impeachment, as I mentioned. So our Ministry of Sport was a huge mess. Yeah. Yeah. And our president of the National Olympic Committee was arrested. So, okay, who's going to take charge of this educational program? And then this, this was the movement we, we, we found. I don't know if I can move on or if you want to interrupt. Yeah, me. I think yeah, we, would, we, would, we would get to that. But I think you made yeah, a valid okay. point. And I think um, in, in, in academia or even in, in general, it, it addresses the issue of should these sports organizations stand alone without government um, should I say intervention? You know, not really interfering, but in, in, in intervene in this area. At and, least planning the future, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. This is if if you depend on uh, the private sector yep. for this event, I mean, just forget it. You're not gonna yeah. get the money. So I, I do agree that since the beginning. If you think about education, if you think about sustainability, if you think about the culture program, you need to plan for at least 10 years. Yeah. Once the games are over, who's going to take charge of this? Because then you're not, uh, if, if you have this in your mind, you're not going to plan this very, very expensive project because you yeah. know that without the IOC money, you're not going to be able to run it. 
Yeah. So you stay a little bit, you know, you control yourself because, okay, I need to find a way to carry this on for 10 years. Yeah. So you kind of limit your activities and you get, you don't get your expectations so big yeah. because it's better to do little, but yeah. for in turn, in long terms, then for two, three years, you, you build something huge and then it's over. Yeah. The, the, the relationship between these, um, um, sports organizations and government is always dotted or theme. And I think um, it has to be defined, especially when it gets to areas like this, because there's a common interest, which is the people, the community. And I, and I think that um, if this is defined, it helps a lot. But I mean, back to uh, my next question, which is Olympism as an ideology, which is manifested by the Olympic Games, says it's a philosophy of life. You know, it runs through mankind and all that. Um, Transformer is over. 2016, as you've said, um, is it fair to say that um, it, it's it's a success or it failed in a way? Transformer, the, yeah. the education program. Yeah. No, it's it, it, it's successful because we managed to create a legacy program. Okay, but this was well, mm -hmm. this was uh, not in the plans. I mean, it could have gone wrong. Yeah. This is this is the point. We we manage in in that situation uh, under pressure. Okay, we need someone to help us carry this on, yes. and we found someone. We found an institution, but it's it. We 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 we. If we look back at the other hosts, we know this doesn't happen all the, all the time, right? Yeah. Well. Um, now, let's the main discussion today. Uh, I hope um, where you work now, um, which in a way has a link to the transformer, which we'll be discussing and and decongesting it into details for our um, viewers and students of sports. Um, I did a little background check on um, um, where you work now. It's called what um, in in Pociana? In That's a very good it? Portuguese pronunciation, yeah. That? That's in good. Pociana? In Pociana, perfect. Yeah, yeah, in Pociana. Okay, I got it. Which translates in English, boost, like to boost something, actually. Yeah. And um, my little background check says that you have, you've, you've um, reached out to a little above 130,000 people across Brazil. And um, you've reached um, 47,000 schools. Um, yeah. And also five, a little above 5,000 municipalities. And I know there are 27 states in Brazil, some, sometimes it's six, and then with a federal state, which makes it 27. That's and we've reached to all these states. And that's, that's very impressive. Now, my question is this, what is the objective, the purpose of um, Impulsiana, and how did it come about? Yeah. Yeah. So um, once the Olympic Games were over, we we managed, and then we're gonna talk about this later, to make this Transformer program into something new, but yeah. still related to our main goals. So Impulsion is pretty much the same as I explained it. We want to bring new sports and new values to public schools. The difference, the big difference is we have a monitor and evaluation department. So we do have every single data of every single activity we promote, and we can present this to the partners or to possible sponsors or anything. And we went digital because Brazil, we say it's a continental country, right? Because of our dimensions, it's huge. And if you try to make everything presential live in local, it's not gonna work. You need so much money. So we went digital and internet is reaching almost everywhere in the country. We still have a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, needy areas that do not have access to technology. This cannot be denied. But if we go, if we go online, we reach a huge uh, area in Brazil. So we offer training courses for physical education teachers. That's what we do basically. Also in partnerships with the national federations and the Ministry of Education. And this is something quite important because if Impulsiona is finished tomorrow, all of our content is hosted, hosted in the Ministry of Education platform. So this is a way of uh, guarantee we are going to have sustainability. 
we're not going to be able to maintain our team, but at least every single content we produce it so far is going to be available for schools. Okay. So um, the, the, the next question is this. Um, how would you link Impulsiona to Transformer? How are they linked? Uh, it's, we, we, we even have this uh, term of agreement signed with the Rio 2016 organizing committee and with the Peninsula Institute, which is the, the company that kind of maintains Impulsiona. So we were able officially to be presented as the legacy program of Transforma. We were able to use all the content we produced since 2013 to 2016 in this new project. I mean, to keep the flame lit, yeah. you know? Uh, so we are, we are actually officially a, a legacy initiative from, from the Rio 2016 education program. Yeah, and is it um, a private um, or government ownership? It's uh, we belong to a private nonprofit organization. It's a soci social institute which already invested in uh, high elite athletes and in the education. And then once Impulsiona was there, we kind of bring both together. And now we talk about sports in schools. Yeah, that's 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 a very very interesting. So usually you will have um, national sports organizations or national sports federations partnering private sector for money. But th this is an interesting um, partnership whereby, you know, you continue um, a legacy that's related to social and community development. Um, if, if Impulsiona is a private organization, um, the question is, how do you uh, partner with government? Because I know it's not easy to have access to the communities or let alone to talk about the schools that you work with. Um, they always receive uh, organizations uh, like Impulsiona. I've worked with similar organizations in the past before. Yeah, how do they questions. choose? <laughs> well, I mean, there are always questions. So um, where we, ha we had a partnership with, um, with the Ministry of Education. So it makes it very easy to enter into the community and the schools to also allow you. I don't know what um, happened in your case. You can shed, yeah. more light, shed more light on it. Yeah, absolutely. This is a very important topic. So we understood that in terms of producing the content, we partner with the National Federation, Sports Federation. Yeah. But then how do we distribute this? How do we make these rich schools? Yeah. So we work, and I'm in charge of the communication department, uh, first in the what we call B2C, the business to consumers, consumers in this case being the physical education teachers. So through social media, through our website, WhatsApp, every possible channel, we talk di directly to the teachers. And we, we say, hey, look what we have. This is all for free. This can help you in, in your daily classes. Just come and get what we want. But then we, of course, we face a barrier. We cannot reach every single teacher in our country. So this is when the, the B2G, the business to government enters, and this is absolutely important so first we went to the ministry of education and we said okay we know that the main important topics for you are portuguese language and math mathematics because this is how we test students in, in a kind of international way right then we, you can compare the level of education in different countries but we also have a lot of evidence showing that the more active your students are, the better they're going to learn. But I know we, you, the Ministry, Ministry of Education, you don't have the, the structure or the knowledge to start promoting a sports project. So here we are. We're offering ourselves to train your physical education teachers for free, absolutely for free. All you have to do is open the doors for us. Help us reach the biggest number of schools possible. And then the Ministry of, Ministry of Education said, okay, before reaching the schools, we got to go to this intermediate level, which is the, the Council of the State Education, uh, Education Secretaries, let's say. So you have the Ministry of Education taking care of the whole country. Then you have this middle institution taking care of the states. And then you have the other institution taking care of the cities in terms of education. 
So once we have these three, uh, these three institutions, these three public powers, in our side, it was much easier to reach schools. And what we do, this is some sort of communication strategy, is we make them, we offer them the, the protagonism in these formations. We, we don't want to say it's ours. Okay, it's yours. What we care about is that this reach teachers and students. You can go, and then of course, we are talking about politicians, right? They love to show positive interference in the in, positive impact in their communities. So here, just this is our data. This is our positive stories. This is what we have been doing. This is yours. Promote it. And then this works well for the last three years, four years. Well, that's that's very interesting. Um, I, I am a little bit intrigued by the Impulsiona. Um, I, I want to know what kind of training or education you give. I mean, your focal area, because one, I know yeah. these teachers have gone through the rudiments of physical education. And Impulsiona, as you discussed, is more of a value-based education. I might be wrong. Is, is, is it the case? Or what do you do differently? different yeah. with regards to uh, your uh, training programs? In, yeah, in Brazil, and I think in many developing countries, even at the physical education university course, you're not going to learn everything you should. Because the university also has a lack of resources. So you're not going to play golf. You're not going to play field hockey. Uh, you're, you're still going to play the basic sports. You're going you're gonna to learn a lot about physiology and the aspects, but when it comes to rules and movements and ways to teach different sports, there's a lack of information. And this is where Impulsiona enters. We, we, are, we call ourselves a, a continuated formation. I don't know the proper word in English because we, we kind of, uh, we do rely on the formation that universities offer, but then we go with some extra content. And we have 17 online courses, fencing, uh, field hockey, golf, rugby, all the sports that are not popular in Brazil, that most schools in Brazil never once practice. And these are, these are courses that the, teacher, the teachers are going to go through uh, from two to 40 hours. And they're going to learn all the basics about those sports in a way they're going to be able to teach, the first, to, to offer the first contact of students with that sports. In addition, we have over a hundred digital lessons, is how we call them, which is, okay, I'm a physical education teacher, I need a, a content for tomorrow, and I am out of time, I have my kids here, I need to prepare dinner, where am I going to find a nice material to teach my students tomorrow? You can go to Impulsion, you just download it and show to your students the next day. So we go the deep. Uh, we go with the deep knowledge in our online courses, but also the day-to-day -day material teachers need a lot. This is all digital. This is all open and free for every teacher in Brazil. Hey, this this is this is amazing. To be honest, I I'm just listening to you and thinking about mobile learning, e-learning, which you know was um, accentuated some years ago, if not for the pandemic. Nobody, yes. nobody will realize the importance of this, you know, where you have a synchronized learning um, material or app that is in your pocket on your phone, where you can assess it every time. And I think this is fantastic as you discuss it, and this can live on um, ages. Um, I, I hope and that Eric, people... Sorry, yes. but we do have researchers showing that in this first contact with sports, teachers are as able as they would be in presential trainings to teach children. So they're not missing uh, important content. They're able, when it comes to the basics, of course, you're going to get athletics. Online, you're, gonna, you're not going to learn to be this professional, the best training, the best coach in the world. Of course not. But this first contact of students with the different sports, teachers are able to, to do that in the online environment, to learn how to do it. Yeah. That's amazing. So um, you guys also go to the schools and offer like physical training as well. Before the well, pandemics, yeah. So, 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 but it's something you continue doing, I guess. Yeah, but in a, 
we do it, but always looking at the digital. So when we go to the school, we bring this camera crew, they record it and we put on YouTube or in our online platform because we don't want to work for only one school. That's great, but we want to spread it. So everything we do, even if it's uh, presential, we go digital as well. Well, well um, I don't know how you call it in Portuguese, but in English, this they call this is what they call a blended learning, where yeah, you exactly. put this, um, you put all this together and then make yeah. it happen. Hybrid so, learning or blended yeah, learning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what what I get from um, what you've said so far is um, there is um, technology, like teaching, um, providing new ways of teaching, and uh, through the dissemination of your inf- of the impulse inf- information online and then also the value-based education which is also key and 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 then what again yeah and then you know having information ready ready um anytime you want to have access to but my next question is um who how is it run what is the management the organizational structure like i should have asked this earlier but i think it would be great to uh, tell us how impulse yeah. is run yeah sure so as I mentioned, we belong to this social institute. Yeah. And I, until last year, 100, 100% of our budget came from it. So we were fully sponsored by this one institute. And this is a privilege. I mean, this is something quite rare in terms of uh, STP and NGOs in the area of sports. We know them, right? Yeah. And then our... Uh, Impulsiona is pretty much divided into three areas. The pedagogical team, which is responsible for all the materials we produce and all the formations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Monitoring and evaluation team, which is looking at all the data possible. So I know today if this teacher from uh, the countryside of Brazil, a very tiny school with 50 students, which material he's using, how much he's enjoying it. We know pretty much everything we, we are able to because of this team. And then, of course, they communicate, right? Yeah. If the data is showing that the material is not being useful, then, okay, let's go again to the pedagogical team and see what we can change. And yeah. it's a tripod with, and, uh, with the communication team, which yeah. I'm in charge because we get the content we get the data, we make it the best way possible, and then we take it to the schools. Yeah. So this is how we are divided. Uh, right now, once we, we are now the biggest uh, physical education and sports education program in Brazil. As you mentioned, we, are in, we reached 30% of Brazilian schools. They have at least one of our activities or materials. And this is 45,000 schools, so yeah. a lot of people. So once we, we reached this level, some companies came to us, say, okay, we want to partner with you. So now we're getting money from different sources yeah. and looking at a more sustainable way of working. But again, all of our material is hosted in the Ministry of Education online platform. So right. if tomorrow something happens, it's going to be there. And this is something that makes me more comfortable to work. You know? Yeah. So um, now let's come back to the um, the training program um, that we were talking about. Um, regarding the training program before the pandemic, I think you've explained this already. Um, how are your programs? Were they periodic or um, it's continuous? You can tell us about it. Yeah. Uh, we are a, a team of six people actually in the office and none of us are experts in terms of sports or physical education. I'm a journalist, for instance. So we really depend on the partnership with the the national federations or other institutions that own the the knowledge, that have the knowledge in terms of sports. So we are always looking for different partners to produce new content. We do not have have this uh, schedule in, in terms of producing content, it's okay. We have a new partnership with the Boxing Federation. Boom, let's create a course, let's create material, let's create some news. And then we go to another institution, we partner, and then we go on as much as we can. So uh, last year, 
We also had this seminar in the first seminar of Sao Paulo, it's the biggest city in Brazil, with yep. physical education teachers, over 400 physical education teachers sharing some projects, sharing their studies. Uh, so we went also beyond this only practice area, we went for the academic, and this was something nice. But we are really focused on the digital. Even before the pandemics, we were already looking at our website and our e-learning platform. Yeah. Well, you've, you've mentioned that the program has targeted um, teachers um, who are equipped to, you know, um, discharge their duties very well. Um, is it fair to say they are your target group or um, you have more target group beyond the teachers? Mm, yeah. Uh, first thing is we we say teachers, but they're not this one unified group, yeah. and especially in such a big country as Brazil, they have yeah. a lot of different realities. So we have the teachers with the structure, the perfect structure from private schools. They have yeah. uh, everything they want, and we have the really poor public schools which do not have the the resources. So. We need to not only offer different materials, but also to communicate in a different way. We segment, I'm not sure this is an English word. Yeah, I mean, it's but segment is yeah. an English word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything we do. So, for instance, let's say fencing. This is a very elite sport, right? Yeah. Uh, but you can build a, a sword using just a tube and a, a bottle of Coke, for example. Yeah. If you teach, the, the physical education teacher of a uh, public school, how to do this, they're going to be able to teach the same sport as a private school. So we look mostly at physical education teachers, but in a very, very different way. I also I have here, I was actually having a meeting about this. So yeah. This is a badminton racket that we use very simple material. This costs, I would say, five to ten reais, which is two dollars, three dollars to produce and it's quite easy. So teachers can make this at their home or make this with their students and play different sports. Uh, beyond teachers, just to finish your question, we do speak to the principals of the schools because they, they have this authority, let's say, to say, okay, I, I wanna invest in physical education. I need my teacher to go to this training, et cetera. And the pedagogical coordinator, which is a position that connects all the, the other subjects, the other topics in schools. So we can try to make the physical education classes and sports useful in different areas. For example, there was this research, I think in Norway, on how to use basketball to increase the motivation in, in math classes. So okay. you still, you count in different ways, your shots and et cetera. So we also try to do this. Okay, so um, I think you've said much. Uh, we're hitting one hour. I don't want it to be boring. But um, in, in terms of funding, you mentioned um, <clears throat> it's a private organization or maybe NGO, anyhow you call it. Um, and then you had some sponsors. Are, are there any other ways in which you, you raise funds to support this program? No, in Pulsiona, no. We are fully funded by the private sector. We, we are now starting to apply to some, uh, how do you call this in English? The editor. Well, the, this, this contest where they, they choose projects to give money. I forgot the word in English. Uh, and we got chosen in one of them. So we're getting yeah. some fund, fund from, funding from them. But no, basically, it, it comes from one company. And it's true that if this family says, OK, I'm not going to invest in sports anymore, Impulsiona is not going to go on as an institution. Our content is still going to be available, but we're not going to produce anything more. Yeah. So it's kind of sustainable <laughs> uh, in terms of material, but we're yeah. going to finish the, the, the work, you know? Yeah. And this is a challenge for everyone, I think. Well, I mean, I you you almost took the next question away from me. Sorry. I, will still ask, <laughs> I will still ask again because um, 
Do you see Impulsiona active in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah. You know, uh, I did this webinar last night. And when you look at the way teachers react to everything we offer, they love it so much. I mean, it's so important in their daily life. Sometimes I forget, you know, I get just focused on the daily work and I, some, I spend like a week or two weeks without speaking to a teacher. And then once you promote these events and you see their reactions, you say, okay, I got to find a way to keep this working for five, 10, 20 years yeah. because it's really helping. It's been important for them. Yeah. So I do believe we're able to do this once if we maintain the partnership with the public private, the public sector strong, the public power. Well, if we lose the Ministry of Education or this intermediate powers, then yes. it's over. We need them. This is and, and, and it's something important. We gotta look beyond the politicians and the, who is running the government now. This is we just look at the teachers. So it doesn't really matter if I agree or not to who is in power in, in our capital and in our departments, because I need yeah. to focus on and making education better. And we are, we are since 2020 trying to reach other companies to bring people from different areas. So I do see it happening. And I think we're doing this movement, you know, well, I'm, clearly, I'm talking a lot, right? Sorry. Clearly, <laughs> clearly that's a very tough question to, to unpack. It is. And, it is. and my, final, my final question is um, regarding, you spoke about monitoring and evaluation. How do we evaluate and how do you share this with um, government, telling them that yeah. um, PE teachers respond positively. And so there's a need to augment the physical education program. So two yeah. questions, how do you evaluate and how do you share with government? Okay, so uh, until the moment they download the material or they uh, go through an on on online course, we know if they like it or not, if they think they're gonna be able to apply it with their students or not. So this is before practicing their sports in their schools. The challenge is, okay, how do we know if they are really using it at their classes or not? Because of course we get some feedback. We get videos, we get photos on social media, but not in this structural general way. So what yeah. we're doing for the last two years is we created challenges, national challenges. For instance, the last one was the, teen, the tennis challenge. We, we have these online courses of, of tennis with the National Federation. And we, we challenged the teachers to give a tennis classes, a tennis class with, for their students. Then they would describe the class, say what resources they used, what were, were their goals, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, give it to us. And then we had three prizes, balls and rackets for the winning schools. This is a way of getting back of getting the feedback, of getting what's happening in, in the field, you know? It's really hard. I think this is where we struggle the most in terms of online programs, because you, you know the teacher opinion, but um, unless you go to the school, you're not gonna find out if it's being done or not. And then the second question, second part of the question, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we are full online. So we have this da Google Data Studio yeah. uh, sheet, and it's automatically updated. So the Ministry of Education, for example, you can look today and it's gonna say, okay, how many schools use it? How many teachers from where, from where are they? How do they evaluate it? So this is all digital and it's, it helps us a lot to, to talk to the public power. Yeah. Anyway, on that note, I mean, thank you so much um, for the time. I think you've done justice to the Olympic legacy even though it's, it's, it's very difficult to, um, yeah. you know, to, to talk about. Um, usually, Relative legacy, I would say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been the <laughs> topic for discussion um, for all, all countries and cities hosting the Olympic Games. But clearly, as you've mentioned, you cannot run sports in isolation, whether by government, whether by non-government organization, whether by private organization. There is always the need for strategic partnership yes. to ensure that programs live beyond expectation on that note i want to thank you so much for your time i don't know if you have something to say but i want to thank you um, for the time to explain this and, and i hope um, um, people out there uh, would understand how 
the Olympic operates is beyond two weeks. And there are so many things that um, is connected to the Olympics. Anything to yeah. say? No, just thank you, Dirk, for the invitation, for the space. And I hope Tokyo 2020 slash 2021 is able to, to host nice games during this pandemic. And Beyond. for everyone who's watching, stay home, stay healthy. I hope we all get vaccinated soon. Yeah. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.